Well, thank you very much, uh, Dana, for the introduction, and thank you to the Tyndall Centre uh, for inviting me. Uh, the talk is about uh, how did we get into a situation where fossil fuel consumption has grown to the extent where it's causing so much damage, and why has it continued to grow even after the scale of the damage became generally recognised after the discovery in the late 1980s of global warming and the causal role of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The talk's based on uh, the book that Dana mentioned, which is on the global history of fossil fuel consumption uh, since 1950, uh, which, will, which will be published uh, in the summer. Uh, just before moving on, uh, the word unsustainable uh, appears in the title. And of course, uh, sustainable is one of those words like democracy or freedom, which has many meanings. Uh, coal production since the Industrial Revolution has involved the deaths of thousands of miners uh, every year in coal producing countries. And air pollution caused by uh, coal burning has resulted in the illness or death of urban residents uh, in those countries uh, for all that time. And in that sense, of course, uh, fossil fuel consumption has always been uh, unsustainable. However, the discovery uh, of the global warming effect and uh, the role of greenhouse gas emissions in it and the fact that it threatens not only uh, coal miners, not only uh, urban residents but whole nations uh, through uh, more volatile weather, sea level rise and all the rest of it, I think makes uh, fossil fuel consumption unsustainable uh, in a new way and makes the transition away from it uh, necessary and urgent and that's what the title uh, means. Now who cares uh, about history? Uh, the history matters to anyone uh, who thinks the transition away from fossil fuels uh, needs to happen. Understanding uh, the history uh, of fossil fuel consumption helps us to look towards that uh, transition and uh, just to clarify uh, you can probably tell from the fact that the tweet is uh, spelt correctly and uh, the grammar is correct that it's actually not uh, by President Trump. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to speak about uh, today is uh, an overview. I'm going to talk about technological systems that consume fossil fuels and the way that they're embedded uh, in social and economic systems. I'm going to run through the chronologies and at the end uh, come to uh, some conclusions. So here's the overview. This slide shows that the level of fossil fuel uh, production globally since 1800, so basically since the Industrial Revolution uh, and sin since the genesis of that system based on coal burning and particularly the steam engine, and, I'm gonna, and I've marked out uh, on the slide two turning points. The first is around 1870. Uh, not only did uh, consumption rise very substantially, so more or less doubling between the 1860s and the 1880s, um, but at, in that period uh, we had the so-called second industrial revolution, when a group of technologies came into use that really expanded uh, fossil fuel consumption, and many of which uh, underlie the technologies that consume fossil fuels today. So the steam turbine uh, used to produce electricity, uh, the electricity networks, and the internal combustion engine uh, date from this period. And shortly after that, uh, really as a byproduct of uh, the uh, production of poison gas during the First World War, came the uh, first fabrication of chemical fertilizers uh, for agriculture. So uh, that's the first turning point. The second turning point around 1950 marks a really rapid quantitative expansion of the whole uh, system that consumes uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so in the 1960s, uh, global fossil fuel production and consumption was about three times the level of the 1940s. In the 2000s, about seven times uh, the level of the 1940s. Uh, to say the same thing in another way, it now takes roughly uh, three years for the world economy to consume the amount of fossil fuels that it consumed during the entire uh, 19th century. Um, People working on uh, global warming, and uh, including people here at the uh, Tyndall Centre, uh, talk about carbon budgets. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, 
the amount of carbon that can be poured into the atmosphere before global warming hits dangerous levels. And depending on uh, what you think dangerous is and what the dangerous level is, uh, at the current rate of consumption we will get, uh, we will use up that budget uh, sometime between uh, the mid-2020s and the mid-2030s. Uh, so um, this hugely expanded level of consumption fits with a concept advanced by Earth system researchers of a great acceleration in the late 20th century of the impacts of human activities of all kinds on our ecological surroundings, and I think that's a useful uh, way of looking at it. Um, this is the consumption of commercially traded energy products over about the last half century. There are small rows there uh, showing hydro and other renewables and nuclear, but most of this is fossil fuels. The blues and the purples at the bottom are the OECD countries, which I'll call the rich countries, and the others are the uh, reds and yellows uh, the countries outside the rich world. And what's striking, you can see the marker, the 1992 Rio Agreement, when the world's governments gathered and acknowledged that something had to be done uh, to reduce uh, fossil fuel consumption. And consumption growth not only continued after that, uh, but uh, accelerated. So what are the drivers of that uh, growth? In the front section of the IPCC reports, uh, it states that population growth and economic growth are the main drivers. And I want to put a case that that's wrong, and that while there's a clear causal relationship between economic growth and uh, fossil fuel consumption growth, uh, the influence of population growth is very indirect and mediated uh, by other factors, because individual consumers are at the end of these uh, technological uh, systems. Uh, the graph on the left is uh, China, uh, where... Uh, energy consumption has long uh, been growing faster than uh, population uh, and took a particular upswing uh, in the early 2000s, not because there was any change in the rate of uh, population growth, but because uh, the industrial boom began and the associated urbanization and large-scale population movement towards those areas on the eastern coast uh, where the industrial activity uh, goes on. We also know from research in India that the addition of hundreds of millions of people to the electricity networks in the last 30 years or so has caused far less extra fossil fuel consumption uh, in India than the growth of urban industry and higher consumption uh, by uh, urban fuel users. So very little correlation between population growth and uh, fuel consumption. There is correlation between economic growth uh, and fuel consumption. Uh, I want to try to break down what is meant by economic growth and look at how fossil fuels are consumed in the course of economic activity. And I think to do that, uh, we need to start with the uh, technologies. So this is the, uh, just a, a representation of the categories that researchers use to show the changing forms of energy uh, in the technological systems now uh, dominant in society. Uh, I'm sure there are physicists here. Any physicist will tell you that uh, energy is neither produced nor consumed. It changes its form. And when non-scientists like me talk about it being consumed, we merely mean that it's, uh, it's going from one form to another in the uh, system. So uh, just to run through uh, the categories, uh, for any of you who aren't already familiar with this, I'm looking at the audience and thinking that most of you already are. But So uh, to take the uh, example of oil, the uh, primary energy, the oil coming out of the ground, uh, goes to the refinery. Uh, among other products, uh, out of the refinery comes petrol. The petrol goes into the car engine. Uh, that engine turns it into uh, uh, motive power, acceleration, overcoming air resistance, etc. Uh, useful energy, that provides an energy service to get from one uh, place to the other. Um, researching this as a historian, what struck me is that the research of energy flows itself has a history, and that in the 1970s, after the oil price shocks and under the influence of environmentalism, researchers began to focus on the relationship of those energy services at the end with the forms of energy that supplied those services. 
and began to look uh, at opportunities for conservation uh, in, in the rich world after the Second World War, really for the first time, because before that energy had been uh, apparently uh, unlimited and apparently cheap. Um, that changed and then serious research began on uh, whether the energy services required were provided most effectively by uh, the uh, technological systems that provided them. In the 1990s there was a further uh, development on this uh, by researchers who looked particularly at uh, individual consumption and what to me was a very important insight, uh, the distinction between discretionary and non-discretionary consumption. So that uh, if you count my share of uh, the United Kingdom's electricity consumption, the discretionary part is when I turn the light on and it's my choice to light that room at night. Um, but there's also a non-discretionary uh, part. I don't get to choose how the streets are lit, how the uh, office blocks that leave their lights on are lit, uh, how the uh, centralised uh, power station based system works in general with the uh, wastes and inefficiencies that are inherent uh, to it and researchers bracketed all that under um, non-discretionary consumption and um, it's noticeable that this distinction is all too often uh, pushed into the background partly uh, perhaps because it disrupts narratives that focus on uh, consumers individual uh, responsibility rather than on these uh, technological uh, systems. Um, the other thing that's clear from looking at the history of uh, this research is that the engineers have known all along uh, that these systems can be not only en energy intensive but even wasteful and they've understood what is wrong with them. So uh, 1962 uh, the economists and engineers got together and looked at uh, what was the cost to the American economy not of providing the energy service of getting from place to place in cars which may not by the way be the best way to get uh, from place to place uh, but that's just the cost of the annual model change um, which has nothing to do with getting anybody from place to place but uh, is to do with uh, feeding the car culture is to do with uh, especially at that time, heavier and uh, more gas-guzzling uh, cars. And five billion a year doesn't sound like a lot now when you think about the sums that were lost in the banking crisis, but in the 1960s, that was a lot of money. Uh, the next example was from Amory Lovins, the, uh, a pioneering voice on energy conservation who compared using centralised coal-fired electricity generation to supply electric heaters in people's homes to cutting butter with a chainsaw. Uh, there's a quote there on the uh, waste of resources inherent in uh, additional industrial capacity. And the last quote, I think, is a, a slightly different uh, issue of the potential for uh, reducing energy consumption in electricity networks with the sort of technology that we all have in our pockets on our mobile phones which has been available uh, for 20 odd years and is not used for that purpose and as the authors of the global energy assessment said it's used to uh, for electricity meters to hold retail consumers hostage but not uh, to transform the industry in the way uh, that it could be transformed for energy conservation and to the historian the question is why are technologies used uh, in the way that they are the answers are usually not technological. They are social and economic, the relative costs of energy and labour, the market dynamics that encourage energy uh, to be used in a profligate way, whether in cars in the 60s, in industry in the 80s, uh, in electricity networks in the 2000s. What I've argued in the book is that uh, these technological systems are embedded in social and economic systems and we need to understand the dynamics between them. And those social and economic systems have uh, expanded in specific ways since the middle of the 20th uh, century and it's through these that we've really seen the huge additions to uh, 
the total fossil fuel <coughs> consumption. Uh, so industrialization, particularly outside the rich countries, uh, changes in the labor process, uh, proliferation of industrial materials manufacture. Uh, steel, yes, was produced uh, before the Second World War, but plastics and aluminium uh, really are post-Second World War uh, products. Uh, electrification, urbanization, uh, cities use more energy than uh, the countryside, motorization, and large-scale material consumption and consumerism, which in the 19th century were uh, for very small social elites, but which have spread across the rich world uh, in the 20th century and even reached some islands uh, outside uh, the rich world. Another process that, uh, another process that uh, comes out to you as a historian is that Fossil fuels, electricity, have been commodified, uh, treated as commodities traded in the market um, as capitalist economic relations have spread uh, through uh, the 19th and 20th centuries. It's very easy for urban residents of the current generation to take this way of doing things for granted. But in the middle of the 20th century, most people in the world lived essentially outside of the commercial uh, commodified uh, energy system. Their main fuels, they, they were mainly in the countryside outside the rich world. Their main fuels were firewood and other material collected from their natural surroundings, very often by women and children walking many kilometers uh, per day to collect uh, those fuels. The commercial energy system has expanded massively in the past half century, but even now uh, a billion people live outside it and uh, it, on a world scale, even more, uh, which is represented by the orange uh, blocks in those columns, uh, there are even more people living halfway between uh, the world of commercial uh, energy, perhaps with some intermittent access to electricity, but also with one foot still in the uh, world of biofuels, which perhaps they might typically use for cooking, and that's particularly in the expanding cities outside uh, the rich world. What the uh, graph on the right shows is that in Africa, it's still uh, the uh, majority of the population living completely outside uh, this commercial energy system. Uh, the green uh, blocks are those that have no electricity, which I think largely you can use that as a proxy for those who live outside uh, the commercial system. Um, Another point about that commercial energy system is that I, I, in the book I've divided that into uh, two. On the one hand, there are most of these fuels that are supplied simply on a commercial basis, but there's also a tradition uh, a, or a trend which goes back to the 19th century and the urbanization of rich world cities of supplying uh, especially electricity uh, and sometimes gas uh, as a, essentially as a state benefit. Uh, cheap or free to urban populations and to urban uh, industry. Uh, as the labor movement developed uh, in those cities, it very often promoted the idea that such services belong to working people as of right. The electricity corporations who saw this, th their product as something to be sold to make money did not agree. And, uh, there were conflicts at that time uh, between these approaches and towards the end of the 20th century as hundreds of millions of people outside the rich world have uh, moved from countryside into towns we've seen some extraordinarily sharp conflicts in those towns between residents who again have uh, got the idea that uh, modern urban living should mean that electricity is yours as of right and corporations who want to uh, sell it to them despite the fact that they simply don't have uh, the money to pay. And governments have had to negotiate uh, those conflicts and find ways out of them in many uh, countries. Uh, another aspect of the inequality which is inherent in uh, the energy system uh, is shown on this slide. Uh, the, so in these pairs of columns, the left-hand ones are Nigeria's own uh, energy use. Uh, the right hand, and they're measured by energy content rather than by money, uh, so the right hand columns are the oil that's exported 
well, it's the, the total crude oil production. The, the little gray bit is the crude oil that's uh, used domestically. The black bars are the crude oil that's uh, exported from Nigeria. And on the left hand of the three pairs, uh, the, as you can see, the majority of uh, fuel consumption within Nigeria is in the category uh, used by the IEA, hydro and other renewables, which in Nigeria's case is 99% uh, biofuels from uh, the countryside. So the country lives on those biofuels, the oil is exported. That's inequality. So moving on to the third part, which is the chronologies, uh, and starting uh, with the post-war uh, boom. Two points about the post-war boom. One is the USA, in which there was a big development of uh, fossil fuel-based infrastructure during the war, a big expansion of the uh, railroad and aviation, uh, of, of roads, sorry, and uh, aviation uh, transport. Uh, the USA plays an absolutely uh, pivotal role. Oil is on the rise, but that doesn't mean the decline of coal. It means that oil use, particularly for transport, uh, expands more rapidly uh, than coal use. And two aspects of uh, consumption in the post-war boom I'd like to stress. Um, the first is the car-based uh, transport. I think it's important to understand the role of the state uh, in the USA in promoting uh, car-based transport uh, in that period. Car-based transport had begun in, in, before the war in the States. After the war, there's a very deliberate effort by the state uh, to uh, push it. So the uh, Marshall Plan, which was uh, used by the United States, which, which was the funds provided by the United States for post-war reconstruction in Europe, uh, was cost one quarter of the cost of the interstate highway system. Uh, that was funded directly by the state within the United States. So four times as much was spent uh, on the roads within the country as on uh, the Marshall Plan, of which uh, many of you will remember uh, from your history lessons. Um, and 70 times as much was spent on that road-based transport system as was spent on rail transit uh, in the same uh, period. What the United States is also characterized by, both before and after the Second World War, is a very strong relationship between the car manufacturing companies and the government. They were lobbyists par excellence. They invented in the 1920s the whole idea of planned obsolescence uh, in marketing, and uh, they are a textbook case of evading and refusing uh, regulation uh, in the case of fuel efficiency. So that's road transport. Um, the other uh, thing I want to focus on for a moment is appliances in households. Uh, electrical appliances, uh, irons, sewing machines, radios, vacuum cleaners and washing machines, as well as gas cookers. These had become common in the United States before the war. After the war, they spread to most parts of the rich uh, world. And of course, the introduction of these appliances is one of the most profound ways in which people's lives have been changed by the diffusion of fossil fuel based energy systems and social historians have researched these changes and their findings uh, deserve reflection. These appliances enabled uh, energy to be substituted for labour and particularly washing machines and vacuum cleaners eased some of the most backbreaking household tasks. I'm talking about domestic labour performed overwhelmingly by uh, women. What the research shows is very interesting is that although the nature of that work changed as a result of these new technologies, almost uh, across the board, the researchers have found that the time spent uh, in doing domestic labor uh, did not fall uh, through the course of the uh, 20th century. Um, new technologies not only eased old tasks, but made uh, new ones possible. So mum, who might have gone, spent time preparing meals in the kitchen at one time, was now out driving around to the shops, picking up kids from school uh, or whatever. Um, the same actually is true of uh, labour outside the home. Uh, fossil fuel-based uh, technologies uh, in industry uh, have also never uh, led to the uh, reduction of working hours. The 1970s, um, 
a turning point uh, and often described as an energy crisis. Um, I would argue that that is a meaningless term. Um, there were two oil price shocks in 1973 uh, when the price rose fourfold almost overnight and again in 1979 and there was indeed a crisis in developing countries who had to borrow hundreds of millions of dollars to pay those oil import bills. There was a crisis that I think was much less real for rich world consumers, uh, whether individuals, corporations or governments, who had to adjust to higher petrol prices but no uh, genuine shortages. Finally, there was a crisis of perception and policy. Governments realised that oil supplies really were not unlimited or cheap and serious political attention began to be paid to uh, energy conservation. In the 1980s, uh, just to stress that well, even in the year 2000, uh, of the total global fossil fuel consumption, 58% uh, in the year 2000 was in the OECD countries, the rich countries with less than a quarter uh, of the world uh, population. But there were changes in those countries' economies and the way that these fuels were being consumed. Uh, there was a substantial improvement in efficiency from the mid-70s to the mid-80s in industry in rich countries. Uh, the improvement continued, not at the same pace, uh, into the 1990s. But many of those efficiency gains, uh, and it's quite hard for the economic historians to pin it down, but many of those gains are associated with the fact that uh, energy intensive uh, industrial processes such as production of steel, cement and aluminium are exported uh, to the global south. This is the period of globalization and financialization. The structure of the economy uh, changes, uh, types of work change. It became more likely that people in the rich world would work at a computer than at a factory, although those computers were not as energy efficient uh, as has often been claimed. The other thing that changed with the changing nature of work and the was the nature of personal consumption. Uh, working hours, as I've said, did not go down. Uh, the use of cars continued to rise in the rich world, along with labour-saving appliances such as freezers, dishwashers and microwaves. And this, is also, and this is the start not only of the takeaway culture, but also of the throwaway culture when goods became uh, cheaper to replace uh, than to fix. And uh, these were essential factors in the higher personal consumption uh, by individuals that we see in the rich world uh, in this period. At the end of the 1980s comes the discovery of global warming and uh, this opens the way uh, for a political discussion on that subject uh, in uh, the 1990s. And uh, before I uh, come on to that, uh, I want to say a bit about uh, electrification, which is another really fundamental uh, driver of uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption. So in the middle of the 20th century, uh, the production of electricity accounted for one-tenth of uh, global fossil fuel use. Today it's about one-third. So this is a really important uh, factor. Um, electrification has been done by the state in developing countries uh, as a development priority. In the USSR and China, as well as in capitalist countries, electricity for industry and agriculture was prioritised over uh, electricity for households. I'm also pretty sure uh, from my reading that in no country in the world, not even the United States of America, did private companies uh, electrify the countryside. It's not a profitable business. It was never done by private companies. It was either done by the state or has not been uh, done at all. Um, and this was a, a, a key uh, factor in uh, rising uh, fossil fuel consumption uh, through the whole uh, period. So moving on to the 1990s, obviously this is a, this is a very big global overview that I'm, I'm trying to put together and I think that in the 1990s it's politics that comes to the fore. The governments gather at the Rio summit, uh, the dangers posed by global warming are acknowledged 
and I tried to think as a historian about the significance of and the reasons for the collective failure of the world's states to act on that. To the extent that these states and uh, governments and international bodies claim to represent uh, society as a whole, I think this amounts to a crisis of their legitimacy, to a crisis of statehood. There's a truly uh, existential threat to uh, all of us, and uh, they essentially have failed uh, to meet it. The battle at the summit itself in 1992 was around the proposal for binding targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the USA, its hegemony enhanced uh, by the dissolution of the Soviet Union the previous year, worked successfully uh, to block any binding targets. And as I think, again, uh, everybody in this room knows, uh, the approach that was adopted instead was voluntary targets to be achieved through market mechanisms. These were codified in the 1997 uh, Kyoto Protocol. And over the last 20 years, that approach has made arguably no impact on the global level of emissions where the voluntary targets have been achieved. Uh, this was not as a result of that treaty, but for example, by the 2008 economic crisis or such means of massaging figures as the sale of permits to pollute uh, between countries. So what, how can we explain this uh, disaster? Uh, clearly neoliberalism, which was in its heyday, uh, played a role. Governments and their officials and international agencies, all under pressure from corporate interests, put far more effort into opening up markets, in quotes, or rolling back the state, and you can see this in the electricity sector, for example, than to addressing uh, the climate issue. What about climate science denial? That's often mentioned. I think it shouldn't be uh, overstated. By the late 1990s, most of the oil companies, and even some of the coal companies, had largely dropped their overt support for denial and switched to greenwashing tactics. That denial continues to today. Of course, it's very dangerous and very pernicious, but I don't think it was the main or uh, I don't think it was the main factor in the failure of this uh, Rio process. The predominant uh, political approach of the European powers and the Democratic Party in the United States and indeed the Chinese government was to accept the science, but to insist that it was addressed. Uh, through market mechanisms. So when we get to 1997 and there's a vote in the US Senate, 97 votes to nil uh, to, uh, to reassert the uh, policy of no uh, binding targets, that's an alliance of climate science rejecting Republicans with uh, market-focused Democrats. Uh, in the book, I've taken as a measure of government's commitments to reducing global warming uh, and the success of the Rio process, the level of subsidies to fossil fuels. Uh, the World Bank's estimate in 1992 uh, was uh, $230 billion uh, a year. That's increased steadily. It, it, it depends on the several ways of measuring, but that has certainly increased steadily during the 1990s and very sharply in the 2000s when oil prices rose. The other argument, of course, that uh, took place at Rio was about uh, the historical responsibility of the rich countries and uh, whether they were trying to force the poor countries to foot the bill. One popular ruse that was used by them was to say it's all about deforestation. Uh, this is a commentary on that by uh, Indian environmentalists. Um, one heartening thing I think that we see in this period is that social movements in countries such as India increasingly see their fight for social justice as closely linked to the fight <coughs> against uh, global warming. They adopted uh, strategies to bring these aims together and uh, to my mind that's a very hopeful uh, phenomenon. In the 2000s, uh, China really is a crucial uh, factor. The, the red line is China's. Uh, commercial energy use overtaking uh, the United States and much of this fuel consumption was the production of energy intensive goods uh, for export uh, energy intensive goods such as steel, aluminium, cement and some uh, manufactured goods and this boom is a coal boom. Uh, this last slide shows the, uh, the red line is uh, fossil fuel consumption as a proportion of total commercial energy consumption and I put this slide here to 
as a comment on the claims that uh, we're just about to get into uh, the transition away from fossil fuels, uh, there was a substantial chunk taken out of fossil fuels share between, uh, between the 1980s and uh, the 1990s. It goes down from 94% to around 87%. That's mainly due to hydro and nuclear power. You can see it goes down a couple of more percent uh, to around 85, 80, 85% at the end of the 2000s, and that is mainly due to uh, renewables. But the economy is still dominated by fossil fuels, consumption is still growing, and the transition away from them has hardly uh, begun. So my conclusions are fossil fuels are consumed by and through these technical technological systems which are embedded in economic and social systems, interpretive frameworks that isolate consumption from these systems and or isolate consumption from production, I think are misleading. Individuals consume in the context of these systems. Economic expansion has driven consumption through the uh, trends uh, that I mentioned. Uh, industrialization, urbanization, motorization and so on. Fossil fuels and electricity uh, have become commodities uh, or in the case of electricity sometimes provided as a state benefit. And yet there's still a, even now a proportion of the world's population that lives uh, outside or on the edges of uh, that uh, commodified energy system. Energy systems reflect inequalities in this way and in other ways. The discovery of global warming provided an imperative for the transition away from uh, fossil fuel-based energy systems and carbon budgets imply uh, short timescales. I want to argue that transition is not only a technological issue. In the past, energy-intensive technologies and fossil fuel-intensive technologies have been privileged over less energy-intensive ones and fossil fuels privileged over renewables for social, political and economic reasons. Technologies uh, have to be diffused. This takes time. Uh, it's good to know uh, that investment in renewables is now expanding very rapidly. Uh, Ideologised claims that a breakthrough is imminent, I think, uh, can be uh, misleading because they can uh, delude us into thinking uh, progress is being made uh, where it is not. The uh, process of international climate talks uh, begun at Rio has made no progress uh, in reducing fossil fuel consumption and governments' indifference uh, to the aims to which they subscribed are best measured by the high and rising level of uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, both production and consumption, uh, since then. The proposals uh, codified at Kyoto to use market mechanisms and impetus for change have failed. Uh, the limited progress made on efficiency and non-fossil technologies has mostly been due, where it's happened, to government regulation and state-directed uh, investment. Um, there are no easy formulas for hastening transition, and I, I, I don't want to come here and uh, present such formulas. I'm always a bit suspicious of people who do. To my mind, the best prospects lie outside uh, the Rio process, uh, radical technological change should be considered uh, together with and as part of radical social and economic uh, change. The change of those technological systems implies a change of the social and economic uh, systems in which we live. And that's it. Thank you very much.